Brought to you by Proto Labs. Real parts, really fast. Custom metal, plastic, and liquid silicone rubber parts in as fast as one day. My name is Michael DiTullo. I'm the chief design officer at a company called Sound United. And I'll be talking about um, design at the C-suite level in American corporations. So I'm going to kick off with a little bit about me, because that's always fun for me to talk about. Um, and then I'm going to move into kind of what we've been doing at Sound United for the last couple of years. Um, and then I'm going to kind of end with a few things I've learned, because I've made a ton of mistakes. And uh, as my boss says, it's OK to make mistakes as long as you make different ones. So I think kind of documenting our mistakes is a big part of our culture and learning from them. And hopefully, I'll be able to share some of those with you. And if I'm efficient with time, maybe we'll get to a little Q&A, but probably not going to happen. So I want to start out with this really simple statement. You know, I think being a designer is a challenge. Just the, the, the moment of when you decide to become a designer is a challenge. Most of your parents probably wanted you to be a doctor or a lawyer or some such. For me, you know, my father wanted me to be an outfielder for the New York Yankees. It wasn't going to happen. <laughs> um, and at about age 13, when my parents asked me what I wanted to do when I grow up, I said I wanted to draw stuff from the future. And it was, it was kind of a very brilliant, succinct, childlike phrasing that I would never think to say as an adult, but is really true to kind of what I do. Um, and I wanted to unpack that phrase for, for a moment, I think, because I think actually every word in it was, was well placed. Um, you know, draw, I think, to me, means to create, right? To be creative, to be mm, right brain focused. Um, and I think that that's something that I really kept, again, kind of moving up to the level where I'm kind of presenting to boards of directors or working with big partners like Google and Microsoft to, to be the designer in the room has always been really important to me. Um, the second imp important word in that phrase, stuff, is also really important to me. I think as a, an industrial designer by training and by nature, even though now I make a lot of kind of interconnected products that, that kind of talk to the cloud and talk to phones and have a software component, the idea of making kind of a talisman of an experience is super important to me, to make these kind of um, objects of desire that have meaning and represent culture, represent where we are and our aspirations is super important to me. Um, and the last word has kind of been kind of my guidepost uh, for the last 20 years as I've been designing things. Um, you know, to be always focused on the future. And I think that really simple statement has taken me on this amazing journey, um, designing everything from you know, medical robotics to uh, sneakers for Michael Jordan, right? working with some of the world's best athletes. And that word, you know, drawing stuff from the future, I, I just try to, I try to, you know, every few months analyze that and, and ask myself, am I still doing that? Uh, am I making my 13-year-old self proud? And that has just been an amazing kind of statement to kind of stick with me. So that journey has been, been really interconnected. I've, I've moved around a lot. I've worked for a lot of amazing companies. Um, I started kind of my kind of path, official path, if you will, uh, on design in, in the 90s. I remember when I told my parents that I wanted to draw stuff from the future at 13, and they said, all right, cool, what does that, you know, what does that mean? That Christmas, they asked for like a drafting table and a set of Prismacolor markers and a T-square. It's probably the weirdest Christmas list of any child. <laughs> but uh, in 1994, I went to the Rhode Island School of Design. Um, I spent a summer uh, studying in Italy, which was kind of an amazing, mind-blowing experience. Um, touring around, I visited the Alessi factory, uh, I visited the Bruno Mali factory, just kind of understanding um, how Italian design and products were different than American and, and how they were much more, I felt, emotional and trying to kind of bring that here. Uh, and then I spent a semester studying um, at the Cleveland Institute of Art where I did a lot of projects with uh, General Motors and Chrysler. 
Um, after school, I went to a small, a really amazing design consultancy in Connecticut called Evo. At the time, it was super small, um, but we had an amazing client list, everybody from Burton and Nike um, to Beck and Dickinson and Hasbro, and kind of cutting my teeth there for four years where if you did really well on a project, you got another project, and you got to understand kind of working with clients um, and, and working for an amazing mentor, the, the president and founder of Evo, um, Aaron Szymanski, who just, just taught me a ton. And it felt like taught me how to be um, a professional designer operating in the world. Um, but at some point as a consultant, I felt, I started to feel a little disconnected from who I was designing for, kind of on the client side. And I don't know if, if some of you have experienced this, you design something for, for a client and it goes really well, and it's like, oh, that's awesome, they're gonna make it. And six months later, you call back, and you're like, oh yeah, how's that going? And they're like, oh, we canceled that. And that kind of like, wow, why is that happening? And why didn't anybody call me to ask me about it? <laughs> and so I, I went to Nike full-time, which was a, a client of Evo's in uh, 2003, um, ended up staying there eight years, where I learned a ton about kind of curating a brand and having it being a part of the, lo the larger culture. Um, about that time as well, uh, Core 77 approached me to moderate the discussion forums. Uh, it's just kind of crazy to think that was 11 years ago and I'm still doing it today. Um, just been an amazing part of kind of crafting my voice as a designer. Um, and uh, I started working with a, a variety of other freelance clients. Because I think for me, I wanted to work for this amazing global company, but I didn't want to be pigeonholed as a footwear designer. I just wanted to be a designer who was making really great things that solved problems for really special users, in this case, people like Michael Jordan, um, and it happened to be footwear. So I started freelancing for companies like uh, Icon, uh, which builds super custom $300,000 vehicles built in LA, and uh, Brooklyn Workshop, who the owner, Alan, is out, out here in the audience today. Um, and that kind of freelance path um, led me back into the consulting world where I worked for Frog Design. I was creative director in the San Francisco studio for a few years, working with clients like Google and Motorola. Um, and it didn't take long for me to get that, even though that was an amazing job, felt like grad school and I could have like stayed there forever in a way, working with some really, really brilliant people. But I started to get that disconnected feeling again, that, that desire to, to uh, to get back closer to the product, to, to get back to working with the factories, to get back to, to having a direct relationship to the success of the company. Because as a consultant, you can make a, a recommendation, but you don't live or die by it, right? You don't, you don't feel the pain if you're wrong. And I wanted to, I wanted to feel that responsibility. Um, so that led me back to, into the, the corporate world working for Sound United. So a little bit about why I chose to go to, to Sound United. I think um, working at Frog, you know, I always say like, you only get to leave a company like Nike or Frog once, so make sure it's for the right thing. Um, and I had worked for some really big corporations and had worked for a massive consultancy. And I had always been in the back of my mind um, remembering what one of my early mentors said, uh, this man named Jerry, um, when I was first out of school living in Connecticut, I had a call, I came home one day from work, I had a call on my answering machine because we had those back then in the 90s. And it was from this older retired designer in his 80s. His name was Jerry and he had, we had gone to the same school but he was like class of 47. <laughs> and he asked if he could take me to lunch. And I called him back, I was super psyched. I was like, yeah, of course, let's, let's do lunch. And uh, it, it began this series of lunches, right? Where every month we would have lunch and it turned out he used to work with Raymond Lowy, and he just was just packed with all this knowledge about kind of when our field was much younger, and people really didn't know what it was. There was no Core 77, there was no internet. Um, and Jerry, one of the biggest pieces of advice that Jerry had for me, I, I never forgot, and that was you know, to find a small company that knows how to make things, that knows how to make things really well, that knows how to sell them, um, that's, that's, you know, big enough to do that, but small enough where you could have a big impact. And when you find that, go quit your job and teach them everything about design. And the, the first time I came to Sound United, I, was, I got the feeling of like, I think this is the company that, that Jerry told me about. Um, 
you know, it, it had this, this amazing kind of 40-year-old history of making really very good things. Um, on the left is uh, Stu, he's our VP of engineering. He started the company in 1976 and is a big part of the reason why our products sound the way they sound. Uh, and has, the pro company has tons of patents around the way we listen and the way we perceive sounds as humans. Um, and it's tons of awards for, for those products. Um, and they really knew how to sell things, right? Those are like the two things like I don't know how to do. Um, and so, you know, I couldn't, I think having this market position where they were dominant in their core category and having this history of making things was super interesting to me and having this kind of scale that was just about right. Um, and, and I think, you know, when I looked at the opportunity, I saw this company that was really focused on what it was doing, right, which is basically selling big wooden boxes that make amazing sound. And they were, their, their secondary focus was on how they were doing it, right? Tons of patents, tons of IP, uh, tons of engineering excellence. But the component that they maybe had forgotten that had been a little bit lost was the why part, right? And I thought this was the part that design could bring to the company. But understanding why people purchase these products, it's not to have a big wooden box or a pair of headphones or a little Bluetooth speaker they purchase those products to have an experience, right? And so my goal of the, as the chief design officer has been to refocus the entire culture of the company on that center circle, right? This is, this is from Simon Sinek, the, the golden circle. If any of you haven't watched any of his videos or read some of his books, it's a very simple concept, but really important. And that's, you know, if you're focused on the what, you'll, you'll never get big, but if you're focused on the why, everything else will kind of fall into place. And I, I, I've seen the effect of that working um, and re-energizing our company. So one of the first things we did as a, as a design strategy was to create really um, a new reason for being for the company, right? And, and that's that we amplify emotion through immersive audio experiences accessible to everyone. So let me unpack that just, just for a little bit here. I think the amplifying emotion part is super important to us. I think you know, music predates the spoken word, right? It's the compression of human emotion into a sound wave. So for us to make that better, to make that experience better is kind of everything that we live for every day. Um, and we do that through what we call an immersive audio experience. So in other words, it's like you can get, your phone has speakers on it. You can get audio everywhere. It's just the fact that the, the quality of that audio has gone down so much that we're missing so much of the music. We're missing so much of the emotion. So what we try to do is create audio at a level where you can lose yourself in it, where you can lose yourself in between the beats of the song. Um, and those experiences are music, movies, video games, really anything that has audio, we want to make that experience more immersive, where you start to have that kind of out-of-body set of experiences. And then the last point is being accessible to everyone. Uh, we, we, Sound United owns three distinct brands that operate for three totally different kind of target personas at three very different price points. Um, and so that accessible to everyone is super important to us. Uh, the first brand, Boom, we started a couple of years ago. It's, it's very much, um, you know, everything from like $20 earbuds to $150 Bluetooth speakers. And this sense of um, creating kind of an innovation platform for basically a high schooler or a college age kid who maybe doesn't really care that much about sound quality, but is going to really abuse this product, right? So the innovation in that brand is all around use cases um, and being able to, to withstand the lifestyle of the target user, which is very unpredictable, very adventurous, um, and then making the industrial design of the product live up to the lifestyle of this person. So it's a little bit more irreverent and playful and the nature of the products are more social. Our second brand, Polk, has been around since 1972. It was started by three friends in Baltimore who all went to Johns Hopkins uh, University. They were all uh, engineering majors. And they basically liked to go to Pink Floyd concerts and rock out, and they didn't understand why their home system didn't sound like a concert. So they started making speakers in their garage, and then their friends wanted speakers, and then their friends' friends wanted speakers. And today, it's the largest maker of loudspeakers in the United States. Um, 
but it's, it kind of has been very kind of focused at an older age. It kind of, the, the, the age, average age of the purchaser grew with the product. So our mission here was to kind of bring that amazing story uh, down a generation to Gen X and make it this kind of American original brand. And to, again, tell that story through industrial design because we know people aren't gonna go to our website and read a five paragraph history of the company. So how can you look at a product and understand that it's coming from this company that, that has had this 40 year love affair with music? And then our last company, Definitive, at the opposite end of the spectrum from Boom, it's more about like a $5,000 super perfect uh, audio experience, basically recreating as much of the studio as possible at home, right? So, so bringing that to, for, to a new level. So and at, at all three of these kind of different, for all three of these different users, at all three of these different price points, we kind of analyze the competition and just try to make the audio experience better than what everybody else is doing. So in all three of these spaces, we operate as a premium. So for Boom, you can start to see that come to life, again, through the industrial design being super playful, very fun. Everything's waterproof. Uh, it's like shock tested, dust sealed, so you can bring it to a beach. We're in Southern California. Um, you can see, again, the little bike in the marketing. Sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> but but uh, you know, everything is based around this kind of sharing music and, and not understanding where you're going to be at 10 p.m. when you wake up at 10 a.m., this kind of teenage lifestyle. For Polk, you can kind of see this kind of sense of uh, an American company come in. It has a very kind of mid-century modern vibe to it, um, especially this product here, the wood burn. It's got an actual molded uh, mahogany top. It was inspired, um, had become close with, uh, or become, gotten to know Lisa Dimitrios, who's Eames, uh, Charles Eames' granddaughter, and she took me through some of the archives for the LCW chair, and just seeing all those bent wood pieces, I was like, I just want to make a speaker like that. I want to make. I want to kind of like bring kind of to consumer electronics what the rest of my house already looks like. Um, and so using materials like real woods and tortoise shells and leather, machined metals, no silver paints, no bullshit, just real honest, high quality products. And then for Definitive, again, we're that, that that user is you know, the opposite of boom, you know, not whimsical, very serious, very precise, very logical. Um, and again, the industrial design reflecting that, where most of the products are made out of aluminum extrusions or machined aluminum, um, carbon fiber subwoofers, just everything is kind of taken to the nth degree. And as you inspect the product 360 degrees, there's all, all these little surprises, and these little winks and nods that let you know that this is something really special and that you're part of this really small club. And Definitive is a, it's a small brand, but it's, it's one of those, it has one of the highest net promoter scores in the industry, so if you know it, you probably own it. Um, and if you don't know it, you might not, just be, might not be good enough for it. <laughs> I don't know how to say that. So, so okay, that's, that's kind of what we've been doing, but what do I actually do as a chief design officer? So there's a lot of board meetings, um, a lot of sales meetings when, we're, when I'm trying to, we're trying to get Best Buy or the Apple Store to take on a new product concept, I go and explain it to them. Um, and so you know, getting their direct feedback um, and bringing that back to the team, managing our future roadmaps. Um, my team itself is super multidisciplinary. We designed our whole headquarters actually and our space is super open, no walls. Uh, it's designed for kind of as an ultimate collaboration space. And so we have a, a set of industrial designers, a group of graphic designers who do uh, packaging and web, uh, UX. We, we also have our own photography and video. And then I have a VP of partnerships that reports to me because we do a lot of work with companies like Microsoft and Google. And even though we're, we're a small and medium sized company, we have to interact with all these big players to make these interconnected products. So, with that, I want to get into a little bit of, of some of the things I've learned over the past couple years. I think as, as designers, it can be tempting to, get, to become very process driven. Uh, and the purpose of a process is to get to a result, right? So if you're not reaching a result, your, your process is, is pointless, it's wrong. And I think in, a, in an ideal world, you set out this perfect process of you know, doing research, 
uh, gathering insights, um, uh, feathering those insights into concepts, and, and building it out as a product. But in real life, it doesn't work that way, right? So you create this idealized process, but every day is a triage. And you're doing things in parallel much more than you'd like. And you have to be flexible enough to just roll with it, right? And, and you have to understand that kind of our job as designers in a lot of ways is, is to shepherd progress, not perfection. Because if you aim for perfection, you'll never get there. It'll never launch. And the only way to make something innovative is to bring it to the, into the marketplace and help to change people's behaviors. Um, so, so we're kind of constantly battling this, this road to progress and adjusting our process as we go. The next thing I learned is to visualize everything. Um, for those that, of you that know me, and there's a lot of friends in, in the crowd today, which is awesome to see, um, and a lot of people that post on the forums, you know that kind of sketching is a, an affliction of mine. I do, I do visualize everything, and it's amazing how if you're in a board meeting or you're in a meeting with a buyer, the ability to visualize an idea on the spot gives you command, right? I always tell my designers, the person that, that does the first sketch owns the conversation because now everything else is judged by that. That's the center of the conversation that everything else pivots around. And I just, it's something I always having to remind myself of, but, but has happened so many times where I've been in a presentation uh, with, a, with a buyer who had some you know, ugly feedback of one kind or another, and the ability to draw something on the spot and say, well, what do you think about this? And for that person to say, okay, let's do it, I'll buy it, is, is amazing, right? That's the ability to basically get people paid, get people raises and bonuses. The third biggest learning I've had just really over the last 20 years, not just the last two, is that research is an input, not an output, right? This is one of my favorite quotes uh, by Ram Das, who, who is not a designer, uh, but if he was, it'd be like the most badass designer name ever. Uh, but information is just bits of data, knowledge is transcending them. So, you know, to understand that, like, research is never an end point, it's a beginning point. Um, and I think, kind of, in our current climate of innovation firms and design thinking, I think I've personally seen research focus too much as an output. And lastly, at some point as a designer, you have to pivot from what it can be to what it will be. Uh, this is something that was said to me by another one of my mentors, Paul Bradley, who was head of the ID um, group at IDEO for 20 years and then was executive creative director at Frog, who I reported to. Um, and it's, you know, as designers, we, we love to be in the what it can be stage, right? We, we love to, we love to uh, concept, we love to look at possibilities, we love to bring new things into the process. But at some point, you have to set that aside and say, it will be this, and I will make this happen. And you have to will that into, into existence. Uh, because as, as, as uh, Thomas Edison said, vision without execution is hallucination. And I think you know, all of, it's on all of us to help execute things. We can't just throw them over the wall to engineering. We have to work collaboratively with everybody in the process to make sure that our vision comes to life as close as possible. And lastly, to design everything. When I came to Sound United, it wasn't even called Sound United. It was called DEI Holdings, which is a pretty generic term. And I think you know, the idea that, that a person could come in and say, I'm going to rename this company, and we're going to redesign the headquarters, and we're going to reanalyze the way everybody works. We're going to look at the reporting structures and redesign the reporting structure. You know, to understand that design has no boundaries, that you could literally design everything at the company and make it work a different way. And in three years, after it's kind of gotten used to that, you can do it again and change it. And I, I think kind of the perfect state is change, right? And so we've really shifted from this um, somewhat traditional 40-year-old company to a change organization that is now just embracing constant change. And that's where innovation comes from. If people do the same job every day for 20 years, you start to get into a pattern, right? It's, it's the human mind is, is engineered for patterns. It helps us to be efficient. But if you change things every day, people start having new thoughts every day. So hopefully you do all that and you do enough of it right.
that people start to take notice. This was a board we had in the office of press when our initial, when our new design language is launched and the first products came out. And we started collecting kind of press and pinning it up on the wall. And then we had two walls and then now we just gave up and we don't do it anymore. But you know, it's, it's nice to know that you can make mistakes, but you can evolve and learn and people start to take notice of that. So that's a little bit of what I do as a chief design officer. Um, I'm sorry we didn't have time to go super in depth on anything, and I only have 15 seconds left, so definitely not any time for questions, but I'll be around. If anybody wants to chat, please feel free. And definitely, as Stu mentioned, everybody has a little ticket in your, in your thing, and at, at lunch you can redeem it for a pair of headphones or a Bluetooth speaker from my company. So thank you very much. Thank you.